Welcome everybody to Samudra Shakti Online. I am so glad that you are with us this evening. My name is Lisa Long. I am joined here with Maduri Martin, who is also one of the co-creators and our co-host for this continuing education for Anasara Yoga. For tonight, we'll have a little bit of background on Samudra Shakti Online, our presentation from Kat McCarthy, and maybe we'll have time for some discussion. So Samudra Shakti originated out of a live event in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, and this was in 2019. And this was the USA Anasara Teachers Gathering. And the Shakti was so big, so expansive that we wanted to continue this community collaboration and connection. And so we are, as I said, going to be in Colorado in September 2023 for Samudra Shakti, the live event. Kat is one of the presenters out there. She's leading one of the intensives. This is our whole, yeah, this is our whole teaching team for Samudra Shakti, the live event in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Kat McCarthy, as I said, will be there. Chaya Spencer, Christina Sell, Christine DeFresnies. Christy McKenzie, Deb Payne, Denise Stotman, Jacqueline Prate, Jay Martin, Jeannie Manchester, Judith Hill, Julia Pairing, myself, Lisa Long, Maduri Martin, uh, Jay Martin, Rachel Dewan, John Seeley, and Tiffany Wood and Will Duran. And I believe there's somebody I missed. Do you guys know who I missed? You missed Suzanne Zuber. Suzanne Zuber. I knew I missed somebody. Yeah. And Suzanne Zuber. Thank you, Maduri. I was like, I missed somebody. Then I had to scroll to try to find them. So even better news, <laughs> you guys are getting the big tips. Um, early bird registration is already open. It went out to an exclusive watch list that received it. But since you guys are here watching either live on Facebook or with us on Zoom, we wanted to let you know, hey, early bird tickets are on sale now. They just opened on Friday. Ticket sales have already started. We've already got a lot of people uh, purchasing tickets, which is amazing for an event six months out. It'll probably sell out. Early Bird is um, now through May 1st. Maduri, is that true? I think so. Yeah. Yes, I, think I believe so. I think yeah. we're into first. Yep. So you have, you have a little bit of time, but I would encourage you if you're considering coming to be with us in the Rocky Mountains, save some money, get your Early Bird ticket. All right, so tonight we have Kat McCarthy with us. And Kat is an Anasara yoga teacher and she meets people where they are and supports them where they want to go. She holds space in which others can safely explore the heart, mind, body terrain, integrating the practice of yoga and empathy skills of nonviolent communication. She's a dedicated student and an international trainer. She holds certifications in Anasara, Kripalu, and non, I'm an NYC, NVC, which I think would mean nonviolent communication facilitation, right? All those letters. <laughs> she has studied extensively within the traditions of Rajanaka Yoga, Nilankantha Meditation, BMCs, Embodied Anatomy, and currently she with, she's with Dr. Gabor Mate or mate? Yeah. Mate. Yeah, more mate. mate. I was wondering that. Yeah. Compassionate inquiry therapy. So I apologize for butchering that. Kat offers entertaining education with vulnerable humor, dynamic clarity, and compassionate presence. So I'm going to stop the share, hand it off to Kat. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. There's a lot going on. Uh, welcome, everyone. And I'm so excited that there's going to be an event in person. I, I miss being in person with people. So I'm very happy to see everyone on screens. It's lovely. In person is just really exciting because it's been a while. The pandemic has definitely uh, created some new realities. And um, I'm very happy to be a part of the all of these events. So thank you. And um, so, um, yes, I'm a, I'm a yoga teacher. I've been practicing yoga for 30 years. And one of the most challenging things I have found is to be able to apply what I learn and practice on the mat into my relationships and into the world. That, to me, is the hard, advanced yoga. And um, 
I do teach nonviolent communication or compassionate communication, which is a way to look at the world through the lens of needs awareness. And that's something that we're going to be doing in Colorado uh, as, a, as a training of really getting into practicing this. But one of the, the issues that I think is really helpful that we're going to cover tonight is what do you do when you get triggered? What do we do? Because there are many options and there's always choice. But often when I have gotten triggered, I don't feel like I have choice. I just go straight down into that immediate response. And I'm not even going to say it's a response. It's a reaction that I know all too well. And part of the practice for me, um, especially with nonviolent communication, is recognizing, first of all, where I go. And then with that, be able to make choices. And I just kind of want to break down the idea because I think the word trigger is used very liberally and I got triggered or you triggered me or there's always this concept of, of something has happened to me. And part of that is um, because something occurs, something pops up and we don't know what to do with it. Or I'll speak for myself. I know how to do it a particular way that I've been doing for many, many years. But I thought tonight we would talk a little bit about sort of what goes on and what can one do when a trigger occurs. And I'm also very much open to questions or comments, and you're free to put something in the chat if you'd prefer not to be on camera or if that's your preference of communicating. Um, because I think that uh, this is something that not only can I offer some things, but in the conversation, other stuff might come up and it benefits everyone. So feel free to, um, to ask any questions or bring comments. So I'd like to see a show of hands if anyone here um, doesn't get triggered. All right. It's something that is part of being human. And I want to, first of all, not make a trigger wrong. A trigger is actually a gift. It's not a gift that you asked for. It doesn't have a return receipt for something else. It is a gift because it allows me to realize that there's something in me that is getting stimulated. And that is not so much a problem, but an opportunity. So I first of all, just want to let the trigger PR department know there's nothing wrong with the trigger. It's actually a healthy mechanism that you are alive and something is going on, right? But when you think of a trigger, and let's say it's with a gun, it's a very, very small mechanism of a bigger piece. And it is the thing that actually makes the gun function when you pull a trigger. It releases the bullet from the chamber and the ammunition contains the explosive material, not the trigger. The trigger is the way that it actuates something to be released. When someone experiences a trigger, there is a stimulation, there is something that occurs inside. And I'll speak from, from my first person because I think it's always helpful for me to share you know, what goes on for me because it's maybe not the same for everyone. When I feel triggered or when I'm experienced a trigger, there is something that enlivens in me, something wakes up, something goes on. It's an energetic experience. But Often in the past, I would confuse that explosive material with the trigger, that they were one in the same thing. But what if, not saying this is true, but what if when you get triggered and the thing that gets enlivened, explosive that's in you, what if that pre existed? that person who triggered you. 
What if it has nothing to do with that person, except for they stimulated something in you that was already there, predated the event, predated you even knowing them? That to me is a very different way of looking at the experience. Because when I confuse the trigger and the explosion with the same person, I then immediately go into blame. You did this to me. And I go automatically into a victim mode. Something is being done to me. And one of the things that I love about the yoga practice that I have sort of been uh, marinating in for three decades decades is that I always have choice in how I am with any situation and I'm not a victim. So there's agency involved. So what if when someone triggers you, it's an opportunity to, instead of have the blame out of you did this to me, what if you could be turned around and be like, wow, that's mine. You just reminded me of something that I already have inside that is painful or angered or sad or whatever it is, right? That reframes it for me. That changes it completely. So then it's almost like I'm so busy focusing on what's happening to me that I can't even think about what's happening with the other person. But this takes practice. And the more we practice this, the more choice I experience. But it also involves slowing down. And I just want to go through a few steps that I have found very helpful in the process so that I can slow things down so that whatever that's stimulating, whatever gets triggered, that bullet comes in and in me, gives me an opportunity to choose another way of responding. Easier said than done. This is not something that like, oh, sure, I got this down once. But don't worry, there are so many opportunities to practice this in the world that you can practice this 24 seven, you know? Like, I don't know, I live in New York City, so there's plenty of things that I can find triggering. And instead of looking at it like, oh my God, I, you know, enough with these people. I'm like, all right, bring it on. What else? What else could, could, could I contend with? What else do I have going inside of me? And I think this is part of the human experience. It's not about making triggers go away. They just won't. Stimulating events are going to happen. And what if it's re reframing how I am with what occurs, not making what occurs wrong or bad, and it shouldn't be happening. What if I can shift it to, okay, this is an opportunity for self-connection to explore something that's in me. That feels so much more palatable. And um, so that's what we're going to kind of kind of do. I, I think that in, in the world of nonviolent communication or compassionate communication, when I get triggered, it stimulates an unmet need in me. Something that I value that is not being met in my life in that moment. But we're not going to get into the whole NBC. We sort of did that once before, and there's a whole training in that. But I just want to talk about just a trigger so it's not like through this one particular lens. Um, just so you know, contextually, um, I have been studying a trauma-informed somatic therapy as well with Dr. Gabor Mate um, and um, IFS, internal family systems work, and polyvagal theory, um, and all these different lenses through which we can look at how to respond to things that happen in the world to us in particular. And I think that it's very interesting to track where I am in my nervous system, because in the yoga practice, we are constantly in sympathetic and parasympathetic. It's just a constant variability, which is how 
how we uh, learn to um, to navigate it, right? We don't want to only live in sympathetic fight flight mode, and we don't want to live in parasympathetic all the time, rest and digest. We'll never get off of out of bed, right? But we also want to be mindful of freeze mode, which is a collapse state that is is also a place to track in our nervous system. So when I get triggered, usually I am immediately catapulted up into sympathetic. Fight, flight. I got to like get into it or like take off, right? There's this thing that can happen. And it happens so quickly that we, we, we don't even realize how quickly it's happened. It's like, oh my God, I got triggered. So part of that is first, the first stage in, in, in what to do when you, when you get triggered is to notice. First, notice something happened. Name it. Wow, I just got triggered. I just got stimulated. That thing in me just got touched. It's like this person goes and touches a deep bone bruise that you, did, that you didn't even know was there, or maybe you did know was there, and you're like, no, 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 no. And they touched it and you're like, oh, right. So just first noticing, I think is very important. And notice the change in your psychophysiology, right? So when I get triggered, the body, I can have a sensory experience in my body, right? Do I get angered? Do I get braced? Do I like get shock? Do I go into what, what is it that I'm experiencing in my senses? That's on a physical level. Then can I name from that what emotions are present? Am I angry? Is there fear? Am I, um, am I just like numb to something? Like these are things that we can notice what goes on. So that is, there's a physical experience and then there is the emotional body. We have physical, mental, and emotional bodies. So we can kind of start to track where we go there. And then I can think about, well, what thoughts am I having? Am I making that person wrong? Or am I feeling like, oh my God, I did something wrong. It was my fault. We, we, we have these tendencies, these... Um, habits, conditioned habits. And part of it is just being able to identify something just happened in my body physically. I'm feeling something in my senses, even if it's like, like heat bubbling up or, or the frozen state of like, what just happened? Like there's all these things that we can tell just on a basic physical level, the emotional, what happens in my feelings and the emotions, what's coming up for me in that moment. And what are my thoughts? What am I having? Right? So that's the first thing is just noticing. And that might seem like, oh, well, no big deal. It's huge to be able to notice this is something that's going on for me. And the more attuned I am with my body and what is my go-to, my default, the quicker I can identify these things. So that's the first step is to notice. The next thing that I do is I ask, I ask myself, what is that? What is going on inside of me? That became my mantra for like a few years. What is that? And the reason why I like that is because it's a very different reframe from something's wrong, which has been my go-to for much of my life. Something's wrong, right? Something happened that's wrong. What if nothing's wrong? What if something just happened? It got stimulated in me. So I can look at myself and be like, what is that? And then it brings about more curiosity. Because then I can look at myself, not like, I can't believe this happened to you again. You're such an idiot, which is what I could say to myself. Or, hey, you upset me. You made me angry. That whole kind of outer blame projection of a judgment. And I keep it to myself with curiosity. Like, wow, what is that exactly? So the first is to notice. The second is to ask, what is that? That already slows me down. 
that already stops me from going into my immediate knee jerk, whatever it is. And don't get me wrong. I still can go there. I've been doing it my whole life. I am so good at judging. It just comes out and I could like bring it out. But instead I use that muscle and shift it to do another approach, which is to notice and then ask myself, what is that? Then I pause. This one's a hard one for me because I am a doer. I like to do something about it. If something is wrong and it's it shouldn't be this way, something's going on, I have to fix it. And I have been busy fixing a lot of things, a lot of my, for, for much of my life. And I'm not sure anything actually ever gets fixed because nothing's broken. So don't take action right away. As one of my teachers would say, strike while the iron is cold, right? Just pause. And that allows, allows me not to feed the blame which is the outer projection or the shame, which is that, that I put on myself. I pause. And I have to say, sitting in the discomfort is not fun when I'm having to pause. But I have found that when I pause and I don't immediately act and I give it some time, I start to speak not from that explosive part, but from a much bigger sense of self. This just happened to me yesterday. I was at the grocery store in the beginning of my shop, got a text, super triggered, super triggered text. And my immediate reaction was <laughs> like, I went straight there. So I was, I, I noticed my body got really tense. I noticed I'm like, yeah, right. Like I just, I, I go there. But then instead of responding and sending a text back or whatever, I noticed it. I'm like, okay, what is that that's coming up for me? Grocery shopped, went around, did my stuff. I was at least productive. So I took some action in that way. I was at least doing that. By the end of my grocery shop, I came out of there the response that I sent on the text was totally different than what I was feeling when I first started. And I'm really proud of myself for that. It might seem like something inconsequential, but that's huge. That to me is agency. And that to me is applying the yoga and this practice into my world, into life, into actual events that are happening, not just a cool idea, but actually integrating it. So pause, <laughs> go grocery shopping, <laughs> but pause, don't respond, right? Nothing ever good comes from sending that email. If you do it before you go to bed, don't. Just write that email, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, reread it, think about it, right? It's so quick to want to be able to just but I don't think that necessarily breeds connection or understanding. And I don't think it's helpful for myself when I just get back into that mode, but I know it very well. So I'm not saying that these, these patterns that I have go away, but I can be so much more mindful of them when they show up that I can embrace them and say, oh, there you are again. All right, come along. We're going to go grocery shopping and then we'll see what happens at the end. And then I send a text from a very different place. So that's the pause. And then we can observe. Next step is to observe. I can track where I am in my nervous system. And I think this is a really interesting practice. Again, it takes time and I'm not saying I can do it easily all the time, but I know very well when I'm in a place of ease, when I'm in connection and I'd say that's primarily the chunk of parasympathetic nervous system, right? We're in this place of, and I'll, I'll actually show you um, if I may, quick screen share. I love this diagram that I find very helpful to track it. Okay. 
So the parasympathetic social engagement part, this is where we have rest and digest, right? That we typically think about, like when you come out of Shavasana, usually there's a, right? There's a calm aliveness, we're curious, we're connected, we're present, grounded, healthy, and secure. The biggest thing of all is that we feel safe. The body not only perceives safety, but senses safety. That is when we're in a place where we can actually heal and um, grow. We're actually curious about other people, curious about situations, curious about ourselves. Sympathetic is when there's some sort of threat. Trigger happens, whoosh, we go straight into sympathetic. There we're restless, activated, hypervigilant, anger, there's aggression, the hamster wheel going around and around and around and insomnia, right? This is a state where we probably are going back and forth typically between parasympathetic and sympathetic kind of throughout the day. We get triggered, we self-regulate, we get stimulated, we self-regulate, kind of go through this area. Now, we're not going to go into this so much just yet, but um, or just at all, but when there is a trigger and you go into sympathetic, if it is triggering a, a trauma response state, we then fall into this freeze and this overwhelm. Too much, too fast, or too little for too long mode, where we're exhausted, we're heavy, there's depression, what's the point? We go into a place that is immobilized to conserve our energy. Whereas sympathetic is very mobilized, right? So can we track at any given moment where we are in our nervous system? That's what I observe when I pause, right? When this thing happens, most likely I am catapulted into the sympathetic. Something's happened. Something gets exploded in me. Pff, the trigger happened. That, that person stimulated it. Whatever that comment was. I'm in that place. And then I want to self-regulate. I don't want to live in that place because that's a place of stress. That is a place of constant bombardment. And in that place, I'm constantly trying to mobilize, right? That's part of the action, taking action. I just need to do something about it. Blah, 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 right? I can regulate myself and bring myself down to this place that is in the more parasympathetic, but we're constantly tracking, right? So when I'm in the ventral, oh, I won't say ventral vagal, it's polyvagal stuff. When I'm in, in, in the sympathetic place where I feel connected, I feel grounded, I feel safe, I feel curious, I can ask myself, how do I perceive the world right now? Does the world feel safe? Is it ease? ease? I can kind of ask myself, like, what is my perception of the world right now? That might tell me, ah, oh, I am in this particular state. Or I could also ask myself, how do I see myself in this moment? All right, these are two questions. What's the world like and what am I like? When I'm in a place that is in parasympathetic, probably the world seems like a safe place. And I'm like, I'm okay. I can, I can handle these things. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm able to keep my sense of humor. I'm able to be curious about myself and curious about other people and not take things personally. When I am in a more sympathetic or mobilized fight flight, maybe the world is, is uh, unsafe. You know, maybe I, uh, oh, oh, yeah, there we go again. There we go again. Whatever I think about myself, oh, I can't, I can't believe I'm so stupid. I can't believe I fell for that or whatever. Those kind of self-talking things. I can sort of track myself in some way based on what I'm thinking about myself in the world. And then if I go into the, the freeze, the collapse, the immobilized part where I'm conserving everything, the world is overwhelming, right? Or I feel overwhelmed or I'm feeling like I just can't win. I feel like I'm out of gas. I'm giving up, right? So it's a, it's a way to track if I'm not quite sure what's going on with me physically, I at least can tell through my thoughts what it is, where I am in my nervous system. <clears throat> so ideally, we want to be able to get to a place of self-regulation <clears throat> in, in the parasympathetic where there is connection, there is safety, and there is um, a sense of well-being. That's where we stay in a place of health. <clears throat> 
But I digress a little. I just wanted to bring that up because I think that's helpful to track. So when I'm observing the fourth state, right? Notice first, then ask, then pause, and then to observe. This is what I do. <clears throat> now realize this is all happening <clears throat> in lieu of me re reacting. This is taking some time. <laughs> so I don't even have time to react to talk to someone and get back, you know? I kind of have to get myself in a place of understanding <clears throat> before I can even contemplate what I'm going to say or do next. Then I breathe. And if I haven't been breathing, I make a point of breathing. And inhale is usually connected to sympathetic and exhale to parasympathetic, right? So we're constantly in these states, back and forth, up and down in cycles. But when I can elongate my exhales, I can even hold my breath at the top of an inhale and then exhale and see if I can release it in a very long way to get the breath out. That can calm my nervous system if I'm in a very hypermobilized place. <clears throat> also humming, sound work. You can make sound. And um, if you've noticed, if anyone sings here, you can have a very, very long exhale when you're singing or chanting or just making sounds. So that's something I can do. And, you know, in New York, if I were making sounds and doing things in, in the grocery store, I don't think anyone's really going to call the police. I think they're pretty used to whatever's happening. But if you have privacy in your own home or car or situation or whatever, you know, just do some sound work or sing your favorite song. Do something that allows the breath to be a little longer on the exhale. <clears throat> then. I start to get into choose. What do I want to do right now? Then I choose. Do I want to maintain connection with others in this moment or not? One of the things with nonviolent communication is it is a practice of being able to um, choose. Do I want to connect? Do I want to cultivate more understanding at this moment or not? And if you don't want to, that's fine. If you want to, great. There are tools but it's not something you should do. It's not something you have to do, right? It's more of a choice. What do I need right now? And I don't mean for that to come across as that, like, it's all about me. What do I need right now? But, but if, you know, if you don't put the oxygen mask on yourself first, you're not going to really be able to help others anyway. So what do you need in that moment? Choose. If you want to maintain connection, then that's one approach. And that's certainly one that we, we practice in, in compassionate communication. If you don't, that's fine. In fact, you're probably honoring what you need in that moment. Maybe it's space. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's just <sighs> quiet. Let me figure this out. And if it's a stressful or time-sensitive situation, I put on my little empathy helmet for self-empathy and just take a moment. It's like, I have, I, I'll give myself five minutes, whatever it is, so that I am able to take care of myself in that moment. And I have found that when I'm able to communicate that and say, look, I really need just 10 minutes. I'll get back to you. I just don't want to say something that I don't mean, and I don't want to react. I want to be very mindful about how I am in this moment. So part of that is also taking care of the situation and taking care of others as well of ourselves. But I choose, what do I want in that moment? Then act. Then the action comes, right? What can I say in this moment to express what I'm feeling and needing while I'm considering other people? In the case of the text that I got, there was no one it was just it was just one of those texts. And I know texts can be very tone deaf but we also interpret them, can interpret them differently based on where we are in any moment, right? Have you ever had a situation where you thought the text said one thing and you go back and read it and you're like, oh, <laughs> it doesn't really say that, right? It's because we were in a different place. 
So also, you know, taking ownership of like, okay, I was not very clear headed in that moment. And then what can I do for myself now to prepare for when I experience a trigger like this in the future? This is making a request of myself. What can I do? Because probably another trigger will come along. Most likely. It might not be the exact same one, but it might elicit a similar thing inside. So what is it that I can glean from this experience in this moment that I can take with me so that the next time it happens, aha, I have a tool. Aha, I have an awareness. Ah, I'm going to sing that song again. Whatever it might be, so that you don't end up being triggified. I don't even know if that's a word, but in a situation and left in a worse place off than you were before. I like to think this has been a lesson. This is what I bring forward so that at every time I get, I have a trigger, a stimulating event happen, I am gaining more and more tools to take care of myself. So then finally I'll be like, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. I got all sorts of, you know, arsenal here to figure out what to do in this moment. This takes practice. This is not an easy app that you like, look it up, what to do when you get triggered. Okay, this is what I'm gonna say, right? But anything that for me is a foundational shift that is a cellular shift in my body takes time. And that to me is the yoga practice off the mat into relationships, not only with others, but with myself. And that becomes um, a just more entertaining and interesting way to navigate my life when things come up that get stimulated. So I notice, I ask, what is that? Even that is just a fun one. What is that? No, it's crazy. Or, oh, I know this one. Here it is again, right? Have fun with it. Don't make it wrong. It's not, the triggers are not bad. They are gifts that just keep giving. Pause. Big one. Observe. Where are you in your nervous system? Can you track it? Get your breath involved. Longer exhales. And then choose, in this moment, what do I want to do? Do I need space? Do I need distance? Do I need to be engaging? What is it that's going to help me in this moment? And then how can I express what's going on for myself? And how can I take the experience that I'm having, benefit the lesson and bring it forward with me? So there's a quote um, by Viktor Frankl, who's an Australian, Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, and a Holocaust survivor. And I've quoted this before, but this is from one of my NBC teachers. And I really love this concept. And the quote is, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Right? So the stimulus comes in, that trigger happens, the ammunition, right? There is a space in between the time that the bullet is released and it hits. That space is what we're trying to elongate, widen, broaden, because that is where we have choice. And that requires slowing down, pausing, noticing with curiosity and making room to not know what to do. That's the other thing. Sometimes I just don't know. So instead of thinking, oh, I should do this, 
I actually make space for maybe something that I didn't even contemplate could arrive because there's space for that to emerge or to be revealed. And that is one of the ways that I am learning, not saying I'm there yet, but there's maybe no place to get to anyway, destination wise, of how not to take things personally. Whatever comes out of my mouth is mine, whether it's a projection, whether it's blame, whether it's shame, whatever it is that comes out of me is mine that's coming out. So if I'm criticizing someone, that's mine. That's not about them. That's about me. And then if someone's, if I'm getting, if I'm the recipient of something, I'm getting the criticism. It's not about me. It's about them. Now, we live in relationship. We can't be isolated and know that we don't have an impact on one another. But it's an opportunity if I get triggered by someone and I and I, I get to a place where I can truly be curious, I can get to the point of like, wow, I wonder what's going on for them to even say something that would then land on me a certain way. Right before I even make it about myself, maybe it's something about them. And it happens to stimulate something in me. Then it's like, wow, isn't it amazing that we communicate at all in some way that we understand one another? Because we're each just trying to like express our monologues that might appear like dialogues when really I want to be dialoguing. So after all of that stuff, you know, then it's like, all right, I'm curious that I can be curious about other people. I wonder what's going on for them. And that can open up a whole new conversation about what goes on for them. Because maybe what I think is happening is not at all what I'm experiencing. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I see that there are some comments and I'm just curious, uh, if there's anything burning, anyone would like to ask or comments about things too, that you'd like to share. Yes, Maduri. Yeah, I have it. I, you used a term I'd never heard before. You call it, I put on my empathy helmet. Mm. And I have some kind of process of self-empathy. If you could go into a little bit of that, I found like that would be an amazing thing at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. The skills of self-empathy. What would you say about that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when I am, when I'm in a situation and I'm getting stimulated, I, at that moment need self-empathy. That's really what comes up for me. And part of that helmet, putting on my self-empathy helmet is first of all, creating a little bit of uh, distance away from the situation. So I'm not in the stimulating event. I can kind of create some, some space from that. And it goes into with a curious, curiosity being the, the, the main thing in that moment of the, what is that I can in, in, in the practice with, with compassion communication, I can ask myself, what am I feeling in this moment? Right. There's a senses of the body. There's the emotional. Am I feeling scared right now? If I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling annoyed. You know, often when I have anger beneath anger is either sadness or fear or anxiety or worry. Right. But the anger seems to be the, 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 the biggest, the most, um, the largest voice in the group. So I can start to identify what am I feeling right now, first of all, just to be able to name it. And sometimes I'll feel something and I don't even really know what I'm feeling, but if I can put some name to it, it, ele it at least gets it from it being all consuming to something a little distant from myself. Then I can ask, what am I needing right now? 
If I'm feeling this way, I'm wondering what I'm needing right now. I'm feeling, you know, I'm really, I'm really scared right now. And I'd love some support or some trust. Okay. That's what's going on for me. Then that can all happen in my, in my own dialogue within my self-empathy helmet. So that when I take off the helmet and then, you know, maybe, you know, and start to breathe, <laughs> um, I am in a different frame of mind, not only physically in my body and my nervous system, but in the, I, I'm able to, to name and identify what my emotions or feelings are, what I'm needing in that moment. And then I also, when tracking my thoughts of what, what am I perceiving in this, how am I interpreting the situation? All of these things can give me fodder to understand how to, how to be with it, first of all. And then if I am in a position where I want to communicate, I can then communicate, not that you upset me but I'm feeling really um, scared right now because nobody can argue with how I'm feeling or what I'm needing, but they can argue with a judgment. So if I said to you, Madura, you know, you really pissed me off. You really shouldn't have said that. You could say, you know, you could, you could get defensive about it, right? But if I were to say, you know, Madura, when you just said that, I, I noticed I got really triggered and I'm not even really quite sure what's going on for me right now, but I'm feeling kind of, I don't know, maybe a little, a little frustrated or sad. I don't know. I think I'm, I, you know, would you be willing to sort of, you know, have a conversation about what's coming up as opposed to me blaming you? Because if I, if I say I'm feeling really scared about something, you, you can't say, no, you, no, you don't, right? It's mine. I own it. Right. So that's part of the self-empathy. That strikes me as empathy, not just for the self but for that person who just triggered you? If, if I can get to that place, uh -huh. I first have to have empathy for myself in that moment. And if I'm truly not genuinely curious about what's going on for that other person, I need more empathy. There's no need to even cross that street to the other person, but yes. Yes. Ideally in compassionate communication, we want to make sure that everyone's needs are of equal consideration and it's not one person over the other, but we're all in this thing together with curiosity. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Anything else? Hmm. Phil has his hand. Oh, raised. Phil, Phil, I do see you want to just open hand? mic? Yeah. Yeah. So the, I think what the most challenging thing for me would be is to respond in the moment in a conversation, because I think traditionally we're conditioned to say like, oh, so you don't know what to say, huh? So you're probably guilty of what I'm saying or like you, you we, we think that if we don't have a response like this fast, then it's probably because we don't have any defense or something like that. So it might be helpful to like practice that, like you say, maybe in a text or something else that triggers you when you actually have the luxury of waiting to respond and, and are not put on the spot. Or do you have any kind of um, advice on what you could say in that moment where you could say like I mean you just you just gave an example where you said you know I, I don't know what's happening right now but I'm feeling x y or z um but sometimes that just it, it strikes me that culturally like that is sometimes already viewed as an admission of guilt or a you know a uh a, 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 and not knowing what to say and how come you know don't know what to say you know it's like right right yeah first of all doing this real time takes a lot of practice it's not like oh yeah i got this down i mean i i, I can't tell you how many times i'm like you know an hour or later a day later a week later oh i should have said Duh. you know like i just it just took me some time it took me time to process it i would say though that when there is something that is happening in the moment and the response needs to happen in that moment, there are ways to take care of ourselves. One of the things that I love to say 
well, I don't love to say it. It's helpful for me to say it, but it's been effective is if someone says something to me, that's pretty critical. And I don't even really know what to say is that's really hard for me to hear right now. So the person is not being blamed of anything. I'm saying that's really hard for me to hear right now. Um, and you can say, wow, that's interesting that you say that. <laughs> that's another one. That's interesting that you say that, right? So part of it is, is having some tools or things to be able to say that I'm really, um, you know, that I can, I can in that moment create some space, right? But if you're stuck in the car with someone <laughs> and you can cut the air with a chainsaw because there's so much tension between something that's happening. I mean, personally, I'd like to open the car door and, and just roll out. That would be a better option than staying in the car, right? And I can say, you know, I really don't know what to say right now. And I'm noticing that I'm triggered and I'm, I'm kind of upset. And I'd rather not say something than say something I don't mean. So would it be okay if we just kind of sit in silence for a while, while I kind of sort this out? Because I care about you and I certainly don't want to, to escalate anything. And if the person says, blah, 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 you, you should have, blah, 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 I'd be like, wow, wow, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's not my experience. Like there's something I can just kind of own what's going on for me and say it. And I have had situations where, you know, the thing happens, the argument that whatever goes, and then we go to opposite sides of like, you know, the space, the house, the whatever. I then have tools to process it and process it and figure it out and figure it out so that when we come back together, I am not triggered. I'm my, my, I've self-regulated my nervous system into a place where I'm like, okay. And then I can hear what the other person is saying, not through this lens that they're criticizing me, but that there's something going on for them because most likely, again, the comment, whatever is their thing. It just happens to be touching a deep bone bruise in me. And then I'm like, so I take it personally. So yes, real time, very hard to do. But the more practice I've had, the more I know what to say in that moment that bides me time. Yes, when it's in text, it's great. It's email, it's great. There's time, there's, some, there's already distance there. But in real time, in person, and there's times, it's time sensitive. That takes like, you know, a certain prowess that I don't necessarily have all the time, but once in a while when it happens, I'm like, oh, this works. Yeah. Did I answer the question to some degree? Yeah. Yeah. And also you, you said something again that you mentioned before, which is, which I think is really helpful when you say that, you know, that's interesting or that's not been my experience or whatever you know they can't make your response wrong they can't make your emotion wrong you know they may not agree with it or think like oh well what a weirdo or whatever but they can't make it wrong yeah yeah and and i i will say when i have said that's really hard for me to hear right now silence it just stuns the other person and then, and then I have more time and they're like, because they're so used to, particularly if it's a family member, you're so used to that script, that narrative, this happens. And then they say this, and then this happens and that, 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 and then you're already gone. Right. But if you change the, if you change the narrative, if you change the, the dialogue, all of a sudden the other person's like, wait a minute, wait, wait, this is not what we do. Um, so if, it's not about changing other people's behaviors, but I can certainly shift mine and that will have an impact on other people, but that's not the point. But it certainly is um, a sense of ownership of what I can do for myself. So I'm living in a particular integrity or value that is important to me. And then again, I'd love to just welcome you really loudly and buoyantly and jubilantly to join us in Colorado in Estes Park, September 17th through 20th. Kat, our presenter tonight will be there. 
she is presenting a 10 hour intensive on compassionate communication. It has a different title than that. And I'm going to toss it back to Kat in just a second. She might maybe give a little pitch on that, but um, the early bird tickets are on sale now. This is where you're going to save the most money um, on a ticket for the event, as well as if you want to add on an intensive like Kat's. And thank you all for joining us tonight for Samudra Shock Online. I'm going to hand this back to Kat to send us out. Well, thank you very much. Yes, um, I think for mostly uh, anything that I like to learn and do has to have humor and has to be entertaining because being human is highly, highly entertaining. The things we do, understanding why we do what we do and be able to translate our judgments and be able to identify our feelings and needs and understand really what is the motivating force beneath anything that we do or say is so empowering and so highly entertaining to unpack. And so that's um, part of part of all of this is really not, I mean, yes, there is a yoga practice and putting it into the physicality of it, but I think being able to um, integrate this into one's life has, has helped me create much better relationships with other people, much more understanding and compassion mainly to myself, which has been sorely needed. So I hope you can join us in Colorado. And thank you so much for your attention, questions, and uh, engagement tonight. And thank you, Lisa and Midori, for setting this up.